Hi, my name is Joseph Dunnigan. I'm the coordinator for the Student Counseling Center here at Oklahoma State University. Hey, I'm Emily Billings, and I'm one of the clinical counselors at University Counseling Services. Hi, I'm Courtney May. I'm one of the clinical counselors here at University Counseling Services, Oklahoma State University. Mental health is so hard to understand. Am I the only one that feels that way? The short answer is no, you are not alone. It is typical for someone's mental health to vary based off what they're going through all throughout their life. For example, going to college in general is great, but it's also a stressful experience for a combination of reasons. Maybe because a person has moved away from their support system and doesn't know anybody on campus yet, are having roommate issues, financial concerns, family issues, have just gotten out of a relationship, struggling with body image, and things like that. I haven't even mentioned the actual college part like going to classes, completing assignments, picking a major, and sometimes changing a major. With stressors like the ones I've mentioned, a person can struggle with a variety of mental health related concerns like depression, anxiety, social withdrawal, amongst many others. These struggles can add to a person feeling alone, even though there are many people who report feeling this way. Just to show you some data, some OSU college students completed a National College Health Assessment in 2020, and at the time of the survey, of the students who completed the assessment, 68% reported feeling hopeless, 50.5% reported feeling worthless, 66.5% reported feeling isolated from others, and 30.7% reported having thoughts of killing themselves. I share that data with you to show that even though everyone has their own unique life circumstances, you are not alone in experiencing certain feelings. It is important to acknowledge and validate yourself with what you're going through and at times seek out counseling services. You know, that's a really good question because I think oftentimes when we do feel overwhelmed or stressed out, it can be very isolating. So it's very natural to, to feel like we're alone, that no one else experiences this. But many, many people do. Um, sometimes people experience it throughout their lives, sometimes for very discrete periods of time. But what I've found is that for a lot of individuals, they do struggle with mental health and even understanding what mental health is. That can be one of the benefits of having resources like a counseling center is you have an opportunity to talk to someone about this. And you know, if you chose to do group, for instance, there's a way to even meet other people who might be facing similar struggles to yourself. What is the difference between mental health and mental illness? Although the terms mental health and mental illness are often used interchangeably, poor mental health and mental illness are not the same thing. A person can experience poor mental health and not be diagnosed with a mental illness. Likewise, a person diagnosed with a mental illness can experience positive periods of physical, mental, and social well-being. Mental health can be thought of as an individual's ability to cope and overcome life barriers and stressors, in addition to the ability to find satisfaction and pleasure in life. Mental illness is a range of symptoms that meet a list of criteria. A mental illness can significantly impact an individual's daily functioning, impacting how a person thinks, feels, and behaves, as well as connects with others. Mental health can be impacted by many different things, such as work, school situations, relationships, family, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, and even religion. What are some early warning signs of common mental health issues? Some early warning signs for mental health concerns can include changes in appetite, difficulty sleeping or staying asleep, lack of motivation, low energy, difficulty concentrating, thoughts of self-harm or harming others, difficulty performing daily tasks like showering or other hygiene routines, completing assignments, attending class or work, isolating from others, and also feeling emotionally numb or being disengaged. There isn't a single cause for mental illness. There can be a number of factors. Some of those factors are early adverse life experiences like trauma, history of abuse, experiencing ongoing chronic medical issues, biological factors like a chemical imbalance in the brain, social factors like not having a support system or isolating from others. Also, just to clarify, there doesn't have to be one specific reason or cause to be diagnosed with a mental illness. Why is depression so common in college students? Many college students report symptoms of depression and anxiety. In a recent survey, 26% of OSU students surveyed reported depressive symptoms impacting their academic performance. It is important to remember that depression is more than feeling sad or down from time to time. Some symptoms that could be a sign of depression include feeling depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day, 
decrease in interest or pleasure in one's enjoyable activities, significant changes in weight or appetite, thoughts and movements that appear sluggish or slow, loss of energy or fatigue, thoughts or feelings of worthlessness or guilt, trouble concentrating or reoccurring thoughts of death or suicide. Another common form of depression students may struggle with is seasonal affect disorder. As the name suggests, this type of depression occurs more in the fall and the winter months. Anxiety is another common mental illness students face. 36.6% of OSU students surveyed reported symptoms of anxiety affecting their academic performance. Signs that you or a friend may be experiencing anxiety include excessive worry, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, irritability, muscle tension, and sleep disturbances. Social anxiety disorder is another mental illness that students may struggle with. Symptoms of social anxiety disorder include similar symptoms of anxiety. A key difference with social anxiety is that fear and anxiety are present during certain, if not all, social situations. Remember, you are not alone. Almost 71% of OSU students surveyed reported having an appointment and or discussion with a healthcare or mental health care professional for anxiety. If you or a friend are experiencing any of these symptoms listed, or feel you need help improving or maintaining your overall mental health, there is hope and there is help. Options include therapy, social support groups, focusing on improving self-care, such as healthy changes in nutrition and physical exercise, focusing on maintaining or establishing healthy sleep habits, and medication. My friends and I are constantly stressed. What's the best way to manage stress in college? You know, stress is a, a natural part of life, but also it seems like a really natural part of the college experience. You know, if you think about it, what you're doing here is constant evaluation. You're being you know, looked at by how well you perform, you're you know, trying to get a good grade, and you're making decisions that are going to affect the rest of your life. So there's just a lot of opportunity for stress, just from an academic sense, not including you know, stress from finances, from friends, from social pressures and other things that are going on. So uh, one I think is important to recognize that stress is a very natural thing. And when you think about stress, it's important to keep in mind that it is our body's warning sign. It's our body's way of saying, hey, something's going on and we need to do something about it. So when you feel stress, it's very important to recognize what it is and try to think, well, what can I do to maybe reduce it? And that's where self-care comes in. You know, what are some steps that you can take to take care of yourself, make sure you're, you're getting rest, make sure you're taking breaks. Sometimes our natural tendency when we feel stress is to push through, try to do more work. Sometimes this works, but sometimes this can lead to burnout. So finding a balance between getting work done, but also caring for yourselves is important. And when it comes to not only yourself, but your friends, encouraging friends to also engage in self-care or have a good dialogue. You know, if you are comfortable with it, make sure your friends know it's okay. To, for them to tell you when it's time to take a break or to take care of yourself, and then you can do that same thing for your friends. You know, oftentimes we just think about stress being this bad thing, but the truth is stress can also be a motivator. As I said before, it's something that can let us know there might be a problem, but in some circumstances that is a motivating force. So when we think about stress, there's actually two types of it. There's eustress, which is good stress, motivating stress, and then distress. So if you think about, you know, our performance and our stress level, at a certain point, when we don't have any stress, we're not worried about something, we don't really have any motivation to do anything or make a change. So if you're thinking about maybe um, some project that is very far off in the future, it's not worth, worth very much points, your stress level or your need to do it is very low, so it doesn't motivate you. But as you get closer to a deadline or something has more importance, we start to see an increase in that stress. And that stress can actually start motivating us more to get things done. And for most of us, there's kind of this optimal point where we have just the right amount of stress and just the right amount of sort of uh, our performance that we, we kind of do things really well and, and we have a good result. Now the problem comes in is when we have too much stress, then we move into distress to where we become overwhelmed, we have trouble concentrating, and we actually see our performance decrease. So when you're thinking about anxiety, depression, stress, and, and just mental health illness in general, there are a lot of symptoms that overlap. There's a lot of times where what you experience when you're feeling depressed can also be things you might experience when you're feeling anxious. And that can make it sometimes confusing. And it's also very typical to have both. You can be both uh, 
feeling anxious and feeling depressed at the same time. And more specifically when it comes to stress, some of the things you can look at are the ways it affects the body, the mood, and, and behavior. So with our body, sometimes again, we're gonna feel things that you might think about when you are feeling stressed. So headache, uh, fatigue, tension, um, sometimes upset stomach or uh, even sleep problems. On mood, anxiety, some restlessness, lack of focus, uh, feeling overwhelmed or irritable, anger. Um, and then on behavior, you know, we might eat more, or eat less, uh, not sleep enough, increased use of substances, um, withdrawing socially, or even maybe exercising less than we normally do. When a person is experiencing stress, utilizing coping skills can be helpful. Coping skills are strategies a person implements to help acknowledge and manage complicated situations and emotions. There are so many different coping skills to choose from. Some are internal coping skills, like the way you talk to yourself, and some are external coping skills, so something that you can literally do. One of the ways to think about coping skills is having a lot of different tools in a toolbox. Sometimes I need a hammer in certain situations, and sometimes I don't. So like tools, it's good to have a lot of different coping skills in your toolbox for different situations and emotions. Some examples of coping skills for stress are listening to music, spending time with friends, exercising, setting boundaries, making a list, doing something creative, going to counseling, listening to the University Counseling Podcast, breathing and meditation, engaging in positive self-talk, all types of things. Sometimes finding coping skills that work for you is a trial and error process, but ultimately what's important is finding healthy coping skills that work for you. Since I briefly talked about healthy coping skills, I also want to talk briefly about maladaptive coping skills. Before I talk more about that, I want to provide a trigger warning because I'm going to talk briefly about self-harm and Courtney will be talking about suicide awareness and prevention. Self-harm is intentional self-inflicted injury that is often used as a way to try to cope with intense, overwhelming emotions. Sometimes people self-harm to feel like they have control, to punish themselves, to sometimes feel something because they feel numb. No matter the reason, self-harm is always something to take seriously. If this is something you're struggling with, I would strongly encourage you to talk with a counselor. Counseling is a place where you can talk about topics in a confidential space without judgment. At University Counseling Services, we are here for you to talk about all kinds of things, including self-harm and ways to keep yourself safe. Some other suggestions would be to identify and utilize coping skills that work for you instead of self-harming. Another suggestion I have is to seek support from a safe person. This could be a friend, family member, or a significant other. Other ways to seek support are to utilize a 24-7 crisis hotline where a counselor is just a phone call away. I think my friend is suicidal, but I don't know how to talk to him about it. What should I do? The short answer is, you should ask if they are thinking of suicide. Research shows that by directly asking someone if they are thinking about suicide, you will not be putting the idea into their head. By talking about suicide and the feelings that someone is experiencing, you're reducing the stigma and shame associated with suicide. Not only that, you are also showing that someone cares by asking them if they are thinking about killing themselves. A 2020 OSU National College Health Assessment found that 24 students survived suicide. 213 students reported telling someone that they were going to kill themselves. Of the students assessed, 273 students were at risk for suicide, and 25 students reported they were likely to complete suicide someday. Warning signs could be, but are not limited to, a noticeable change in behavior, alcohol or drug abuse, obsessions with death, decline in performance or participation in activities, giving away prized possessions, unusual purchases such as weapons or ropes, sudden happiness after a prolonged depression, talking or joking about suicide or dying, withdrawal from friends or family or saying goodbye to them, previous suicide attempts, statements about feeling hopeless, worthless, or helpless, inability to concentrate or trouble to remember, chronic pain or frequent complaints of physical symptoms. So what are some ways you can help a friend who's maybe having a suicidal crisis? Encourage them to talk to someone or maybe call the national hotline. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Encourage that person to seek treatment. Offer help and maybe take steps to get them to assistance or support. There's nothing wrong with coming to the counseling center with a friend rather than just telling them to go to the counseling center. Encourage the person to continue communicating with you. Um, be respectful of and acknowledge the person's feelings and try not to be patronizing or judgmental. 
It's important not to promise to keep a person's suicidal feelings secret. It may feel natural to do that, but the importance of talking to someone else and getting that support really outweighs the need to keep a secret at this point. Try to offer reassurance that things can get better. Encourage the person to avoid using alcohol or drugs, and maybe ask if it's possible to remove anything that a person could use to harm themselves, such as a knife, gun. See if they'd be willing to give that up to you, or maybe somebody else who could hold on to them until they're feeling better. So when we think about mental health as it comes to diversity, it's really important to understand how opportunities and experiences that others have can impact uh, their access to mental health resources, um, their ability to cope, and just the amount of stressors that a person is under. As a white male, I have to recognize that I have different and oftentimes lesser stressors than someone of color. And because of that, whereas I may experience a depressive period or an obstacle, I may have a lot more resources than others to be able to overcome that quickly and not suffer some long-term effects. So I think it's very important to, to not say that just because a person is of color or a minority group or from a disadvantaged background that they're going to be more likely to have issues, but we see that there's real barriers that come into play here. Social injustices, pressures, just even discrimination, sometimes overt or more covert, like uh, mi microaggressions, can have a really long and, and really hurtful impact on a person's mental health and well-being that go beyond maybe just the initial issue or struggle that they may have had. So with good mental health, sometimes we need allies, people who can step in and really try to help yourselves and fellow students. So here are some tips on how you could better be an ally. One great option is to be trained in QPR, or Question, Persuade, Refer, which is the suicide prevention training open to all students, faculty, and staff at OSU. For more information on QPR, you can visit the website on the screen. You can go to okla.state/tat to watch educational videos regarding some of these mental health topics. Remember, OSU cares about you. There are a variety of options on campus. At University Counseling Services, which is located on the third floor of the Student Union, room 320, we offer a variety of services, which include individual, group, grief, trauma, and substance abuse counseling. We also offer in-person, online, and over-the-phone therapy options. In addition, we offer virtual and in-person walk-in clinics, as well as an online counseling service for crisis situations during regular business hours. After hours help is available, Call SAM, which is Student Assistance by Mercy, has licensed counselors available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to respond to crises and provide referrals and consultations. Grand Lakes Mental Health has a crisis hotline available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And we also have the following resources available at OSU. In a case where you might not know an individual very well, you may opt rather than to talk to them directly to file a care report. And in these cases, you can submit a care report to Student Support in Conduct. For these and more resources regarding mental health, please go to okla.state forward slash OSU cares. And remember, if you don't know how to handle a situation or respond, ask for help. There are many people on campus who'd be more than willing to help with resources and assist you.